Hello, Easton, and welcome to the Rabbi's Roundtable. I'm Rabbi Peter Hyman, Rabbi at Temple B'nai Israel, and we are coming to you from the studios of MCTV in the basement of the Avalon Theater. Have a couple of very good guests, important topics. Not that all my guests aren't good, but you know what I mean. Interesting and engaging folk, uh, and we are delighted to, to be here, which uh, ultimately will be the last Rabbi's Roundtable for 2017, and we will look forward to uh, the new year and new opportunities. Um, as I have said before, and as you may know, if you are a, 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 a viewer who uh, watches continually, we have uh, folk on who run for various political offices from time to time. I think it's a responsibility uh, to present those folk, to deal with their positions and their beliefs, and um, introduce them to the community. And today is uh, no exception. I'm delighted that Mike Polin, uh, who is running for Congress from the 1st District, this is my first guest on the Rabbi's Roundtable. And Mike, welcome. This is your first time, I think. It is, Rabbi. Yeah, well, Thanks very much glad, for having glad me. Glad you're here. Uh, let's begin. Uh, let's tell the viewers a little bit about your background, your education. Uh, you were an attorney. You still are an attorney, I would imagine. But, uh, sure. Uh, all that, and why did you decide to run? Well, we'll get into all of that. Okay, great. Well, first I'd like to thank you for having me and thank the viewers and wish everyone, I uh, hope you've all had a wonderful holiday yep. season and yep. uh, have a great new year. Um, I decided to run, uh, let me start at the beginning. Sure. I grew up in a, in a middle class family. My mom, we had seven kids in the family. My dad worked, mom stayed home. Uh, my my mom probably worked a little harder than my dad, raising seven <laughs> kids. Understandable. Um, but we had strong middle class values. Mm -hmm. well, I was actually born in West Virginia. My mm -hmm. dad uh, worked in the mines. Uh, he was a mining engineer after World really? War II. Where in West Virginia? Uh, a place called Holden, very very small, um, Logan County, very I, very poor. I know uh, I know Logan County and. I went, to school, I went to college in Charleston, West Virginia. Okay. That's another story. Go ahead. So um, that's where we started out. I was born there. I did, we didn't spend much time there. We moved when I was about two. But by the time I was seven, uh, seven years later, we ended up in Connecticut. My dad was in Manhattan at that point, oh. uh, working for a, a major corporation. We grew up in Connecticut. And uh, I went to... Catholic grammar school, public high school, and then worked my way through uh, Boston College nice. and uh, worked my way through law school. And after graduating from law school in 1977, uh, moved here with my wife, Connie. Uh, we settled in Easton and bought a house, and we actually live in the same house that we bought wow. 40 years ago. Um, so we've raised our family here. I became a, a trial lawyer and spent my entire career here. Um, 24 years ago, I was uh, asked by Talbot County to become the Talbot County attorney, which uh, I was pleased uh, to accept and worked with seven different county councils uh, over that 24-year period, both Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, and I was uh, happy and proud to be a public servant uh, to really work with our elected officials and the general public uh, to make government work for the people. Uh, that's local government is where literally the rubber meets the road. Absolutely, I mean, this, no question. This is where we deliver uh, the services and I saw over that period of time uh, dedicated elected officials, dedicated staff, um, concerned citizens interacting and government works the, the message I want to deliver is that government works and the message that I carry is that this is our government uh, the idea that government is the problem uh, I think is the problem Interesting. Uh, my view is that government is what we make it and I believe that it's our responsibility as citizens to be engaged, uh, to participate. And what happens, what happens when citizens participate is that the government works better. Yes. The I, government I works better. Um, 
we are a collection of diverse peoples. We have diverse backgrounds, diverse ideas. That makes us stronger. The, no argument from me. Absolutely. Our different perspectives make, make both the process and the answer better. And the reason, not only is it better as a solution to a problem, but it's better as a process. Yes. Because at the end of the day, we all have to believe that we've been heard, that we've had a fair shot, that we've been listened to, that yeah. our voice matters yes. and was considered, regardless of the outcome. When I was trying cases, you have winners and losers. Right. Um, and you try in cases throughout the district, you, you see how different courts, different judges operate. And uh, you can imagine it's widely different. Sure. But regardless of how different they were, if you walked out of the courtroom, win, lose, or draw, knowing that that judge, him or her, had given you of course, the, the, the right, uh, the, the right con good consideration and a, and a fair opportunity, it was much, much, much easier to accept the outcome if you didn't uh, ex get the one. Because the were. process then becomes fair to everybody. Right. And there's an equality and an equanimity in that. And, and that, that's, I, I fully understand, absolutely. Yeah. And that's what democracy is. Yes. I mean, democracy works. No, of course. But, it, but, it, but we have to be engaged. We have to be engaged. It only works if we are engaged. Yes. 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 So, so let's talk a little bit about uh, a couple of issues and, and get your, your ideas about uh, some of the things. I'm going to start with, with, with something that's really uh, uh, important to me, and that is the environment. Uh, you know, as, as the listeners know, I, I often say that we live in one of the most beautiful areas in the world. I, I love walking out of the house and seeing bald eagles and herons mm -hmm. and egrets and uh, having water so close to us. So, so uh, let's talk about the environment and let's talk about uh, uh, global warming and, and uh, maybe the, the whole notion of, of uh, um, the power project, the wind, the wind projects offshore, and you can start wherever you want. Oh, great. Well, thanks. Well, so our environment makes us who we are. The Chesapeake Bay, the, the eastern shore, Maryland itself. Maryland is a microcosm. Mm -hmm. You've got the mountains, you've got the plains, you've got the ocean, you've got the bay, and you've got every place in between. And it's a reflection of who we are as a people in this state. Uh, the particular concerns that we have over here on the shore, of course, center on the bay. Yes. Also, um, global warming to the extent that the eastern shore is the third most affected area of the entire United States. With Dor regard to global warming. With regard to yeah. global warming yeah. and sea level rise. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dorchester County, when seas rise a foot, Dorchester County, one third, the lower county, is going to be submerged. That's, that is... It's, it's, it's mind-boggling. That is horrendous. Yeah. And for this administration to make believe that global warming is not occurring and it's not caused by carbon emissions that are man-made defies the imagination to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords and be the, the only country yes. in the entire world, again, defies the imagination. There, there is absolutely no scientific, political, in my mind, political or other legitimate reason for that type of stance. Well, now, let, let, I want to talk about the environment yeah. generally. Yeah. You know, the beauty of the bay, the, the, the importance of the bay to our economy here on the shore. Uh, watermen have uh, fished and crabbed and oystered the bay from the beginning. Sure. Um, this is an essential part of our economy. We the, the, what I have seen here on the Eastern Shore is an amazing ability for people to work together. People to work together. Farmers, watermen, um, to make, to, to, to deal with the hard problems and to make things work, to solve those problems. So, if we talk about the federal government, what's the role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the Chesapeake Bay? 
Well, we have a large watershed. We have multiple states. Mm -hmm. We have multiple interests. We have multiple tributaries, all contributing to the health or the the the, the health of the bay. Mm -hmm. um, we have a whole collection of different interests. We what we need is a single scientific model to lead the restoration of the bay forward. Now, let me clarify, what's it, tell me what you mean by a single scientific model. Well, uh, first of all, we need to accept that science is real, and, and we need to accept the, uh, the notion that science can provide answers to yes. these problems. And so, the inputs, you know, w getting back to this idea of participation. Watermen need input. Um, industry needs input. Science needs input. Yep. All of these inputs go into the process, but that's what democracy is about. It's allowing these inputs. It's delegating the responsibility to make those decisions, and they're tough decisions, to people that are qualified and that, that are invested uh, in getting it right. And, and there, for me, from my perspective, um, there's also a moral imperative here. Um, in my vocabulary, we talk about stewardship, good stewardship. Right? And I, I believe that we have a responsibility to, to the earth, to our community, to, to the environment in which we exist and which um, we can either destroy or ameliorate. And, and, and You're, you, you are absolutely right, and, and you speak with moral authority as a person who has dedicated your life to advancing the, the, the moral justice and, and making morality uh, real in the day-to-day -day lives of, of, of well, the people the, in our community. The, and and that's, that's, that's no small well, thing. Thank you. It's a component of that. But I also grew up, not, not, I didn't grow up in Easton. Uh, I grew up in, in Old Lyme, Connecticut, oh. which is on the, the uh, Long Island Sound. And I watched as a kid the sound go from verdant and, and filled with life to a num. To this day, there are there are shellfish and certain uh, sea creatures that I, I used to see and play with and capture as a kid that are, are, are no longer in in the sound, and and that's that's disturbing to me. So it's not just the uh, the, the 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 rabbinic imperative, the clergy imperative to for stewardship. It's also personal. I mean, um, I still go there. I, I, my kids grew up there and all that sort of thing. Absolutely. And the same can be said of the Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, no, that's exactly you know, my point. The, the clarity of the water, the, yep. the, the, the sea grasses, the, the, the habitat that we have lost um, is phenomenal. And we are, we, and I say that with a collective we, um, under the auspices of the EPA and the Maryland Department yeah. of the Environment, Virginia, all yeah. of the component states, we have been able to turn that around yes. and, and show some real progress. And Good. that is, that we cannot I, I agree. ever go back on that. We I, need to push that forward. Oh, absolutely. But, but the moral imperative, I want to speak about that. Because at, at our base, who we are, is defined completely by our beliefs and, and, and our morality. Of course. And, and stewardship of the environment is one of the most important uh, moral imperatives because, because we own the Chesapeake Bay. This is our natural resource. Well, yes. We, 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 can, we can use it, we can enjoy it, but we can't... We have an obligation, as that's part of our national right. treasure, right. and we have an obligation to future generations. That's all. To, that's to that's, pass yeah. that along yep. better than when we receive yes. it. Yes, and yep. we need the investment, the commitment, needs to be there. Yes. We we need to have the moral commitment, the political commitment, the financial commitment, yep. and, and the governmental, and which is more than political. Yes, we need to do the hard work. Yep. We need um, to have the hard discussions. Yes. You know, there's a, there's a phrase that you learn when you're a Boy Scout. I don't know if you're a Boy Scout or not, but uh, uh, 
uh, you learn that you leave the campsite right. better in better condition than you found it. Right. All right. Which which then apply. You know, you can extend the principle. Uh, but I, I want to that, move. That, that's a great ethic. Yeah. No, it, it's a one. Yeah. Listen, man. Uh, I want to move on. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, your, your background, uh, experience in negotiating and writing legislation, all that kind of stuff. So as a, as a, as a lawyer, you, you've got to know how to work with people. And you've got to know, you, first and foremost, is your role is to represent someone else's interest. Right. And what that means is that you've got to subordinate your own personal views. You've got to represent that person right. to the best of your ability, which means listening to them, understanding what their needs are, sometimes counseling and saying, well, if you do that, then you may want to consider this, mm -hmm. helping them to make to come to the decision that's really best for them. But once you've, once you've reached that point, your job as your job is to represent those interests the best way you can. Sometimes that means hard negotiations. One of the things that, and so I, I've learned that throughout my career and did that throughout my career. Sometimes it means fighting, but let's talk about the right, negotiation right, part. Right. So UMMS purchased the Easton Hospital and they announced decision that they wanted to move out of Easton to a location at 404. Uh, and to create a, a new independent wastewater treatment plant and a water system to f for a 200-acre campus. That would have had a devastating effect on the economy of Easton and health care generally throughout this county. Um, and for about six or seven years, I was working on behalf of the county council working with the town of Easton and with uh, good lawyers from UMMS, um, working on a three-party agreement uh, and discussing things down to very detailed levels in a whole range of topics, extension of sewer infrastructure. The bottom line is, uh, over the course of that seven-year period, we were able to fashion a result, kept the hospital here. It was a win-win-win. It was Good. a win for the county, a win Good. for Easton. And a win for the hospital. So uh, I'm proud of that. It, it takes hard work, it takes patience, it takes thoughtfulness, and it takes the recognition that compromise does work. It builds a better result. And yes. this is a perfect example yeah. of that. Good for you. You know what? Uh, and my last question, uh, uh, talk, uh, talk to us a little bit about your uh, understanding of the new tax legislation and and... Perfect. Oh, yeah, please. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, before we go, I, I, that's some. So, so this tax legislation is really step one. And the, step two is going to be a, a gross reduction in services, Medicare, Social Security, Medicaid. Right. And this is a reflection of the predominant social, economic, political theory that we see in Washington, D.C. today. It's reflected in the administration. It's reflected in Congress. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. It is absolutely flat wrong. It's, it, it, it's undoing the underpinnings of our social order from the New Deal forward. And, and Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid work. Let's, let's just compare. Well, let's talk about the taxes. So they've given, um, they've created a $1.4 trillion deficit at a time when corporate profits are very high. We have very high employment rates. Mm -hmm. And the stock market is spiraling upward. So there's absolutely no reason to for a tax break at this point because... The economy is functioning well. What we do need is better jobs and higher wages. Mm -hmm. We need better jobs and higher wages. The easiest way to do that is to raise the minimum wage. The minimum wage today at the federal level is $7.25. Now, Maryland has a higher minimum. In real dollars, the minimum wage is worth less today than it was 50 years ago. 
Correct. How can families survive? How can families move ahead in an economy where wages have been stagnant since the 1970s? Yeah. So, so if the real reason for this scheme, and it is a tax scheme, was to raise the wages for the workers in the middle class, the simplest way to do that would have been raise the minimum wage. Put money in people's pockets. Mm -hmm. Put money in young families' pockets. Mm -hmm. They need it. Their children. They need health care. They need child care. Right. They need they right. they need Absolutely. opportunities. So though, so so this is step one, and Paul Ryan has come right out and said this. Yeah. The next thing they want to do, and they wanted to do it this year, is to attack and reduce Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. That's wrong, and for a whole host of reasons that yeah. I haven't been that, that we haven't discussed. But it's plainly wrong. You'll come back. We'll discuss this. We'll discuss uh, more uh, down the road. And good, I, good. I appreciate your views. Uh, we, uh, time is of the essence. Um, we have been sitting with Mike Poland. Mike is running f uh, a Democrat, uh, running from the first district for the congressional seat. Uh, the election is. The primary is June 26th, yes. and the, the general is uh, next November, no, 2018. Yes. So uh, um, we will have you back. There's more to discuss. But I thank you very much for uh, coming at least one time to the Rabbi's Roundtable. But, but we will. We'll do more. Rabbi, thank you very my, much. My, my pleasure. We will be back, Easton, momentarily. Programming on Channel 15 is brought to you in part by the Avalon Foundation and Avalon Theater, a leading catalyst for the arts, education, and culture for Talbot County and the Midshore. The Avalon Foundation. Leadership, a beautiful venue, and a variety of programming provide a special quality of life on the Midshore. And we are back, and welcome again, Easton, to the Rabbi's Roundtable. I'm Rabbi Peter Hyman. And we are in the studios of MCTV in the basement of the Avalon Theater. And I have as my next guest an old, dear, not old, a longtime dear friend uh, uh, who is not is no stranger to the Rabbi's Roundtable, Harriet Lowry. Harriet, thank you for being here. Thank uh, you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And we, we want to talk about the upcoming events that will honor, mark, and, and make known Frederick Douglass's 200th birthday anniversary celebration, which is remarkable. And uh, I, I, if, if I were uh, uh, less edited, I'd do a whole thing about, never mind, we will, we'll, do, <laughs> we'll just leave that where it is. Uh, it's, a, it's Frederick Douglass was and still is important to our area. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on and how are we going to sell, celebrate his 200th birthday anniversary. Well, Rabbi, we have a lot of things planned, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we got started oh, yeah, with um, this celebration. The state of Maryland and the in Talbot County um, have decided that they would like a year-long celebration of Frederick Douglass. Oh, excellent! Yes, it really is. So there's going to be a celebration throughout the throughout 2018 in Talbot County, Eastern Shore, Annapolis. And Arundel County, Baltimore County, and Baltimore City. Those are the five places that we know that he lived, worked, enslaved all all of it. And, and so the state has picked those places yes, specifically. Yes. Oh, those cool. places. I didn't know that. He, he lived in each one of those areas that I named, oh, and wow. at some point in his life. And so we will be celebrating that. Now, along with that, nationally. It's the same thing is going to be happening in Washington, D.C., Wow. Um, Bedford, Massachusetts, and other areas in Massachusetts, right. and in New York City, New York State as well, oh. because he lived in those yes. areas as yes. well. And internationally, it's going to go on as well, because he also um, lived in that. Ireland That's and right. England for right. a, um, quite a bit of time yes. there, too. Yes. Oh. And so there's... Um, this celebration of his 200th birthday is an international celebration, you can say. That's very exciting. And it's very exciting, and it's very important for us here on the shore, and especially in Talbot County, because this is where he started. Yes. He was born here, yes. enslaved here, escaped from here, 
Well, it, well not really. He escaped from Baltimore, but it, yeah. from the Maryland area. And so um, they have asked us to, and when I say us, the Frederick Douglass Honor Society, along with um, the Talbot um, Tourism and Economic Development um, Department, to come together to form a committee to bring other elements and other organizations together to, to plan for a fabulous celebration of his 200th birthday. This is really exciting, and, and, and anybody that's ever read his work, you cannot help but be impressed by the, the two things have always impressed me. Not only the, the level of his intellect, yes. but the vision of his thinking. Yes. And, and, and um, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, for, for lots of reasons. Mm -hmm. Tell us, uh, go, I mean, what's planned? I can't wait. I mean, we, 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 we will participate. We're hoping you will. Yes. We know you no, will. No, no, we will. Yeah. Well, um, we have over, at this point, over 40 organizations, churches, colleges, and individuals who are participating in the planning committee. Wonderful. The planning committee is the Frederick Douglass 200th Birthday Celebration Planning Committee. Long, long term, no, but, but important. Yes, that's but, great. So that everybody will understand what it is, and that shows that shows great community support and, yes, and, and the desire for the community to be in on this. Yes, right, um, yes, it does. Let's go for it. And I can tell you that um, our goal has been from the beginning to educate people about Frederick Douglass and the story of Frederick Douglass and the legacy that he has left, because everything that Frederick Douglass stood for and spoke about and lived for is relevant today. Everything, it's, the, it's his amazing. values, all of it. And so that's our goal, to educate people about Frederick Douglass, to make sure that people understand that he's not just an African-American hero, but he's an American hero. That's correct. Because of everything that he stood for. And also to celebrate and honor him. And this we can do throughout the year. And the last thing is to inspire people the diverse communities around our county, around the Eastern Shore and beyond to inspire them to go out and take action of service. And so in doing that, we have planned in January, the, the uh, Talbot County Council will do a proclamation to claim this, the 2018 is the year of Frederick Douglass. Oh, how cool. And they will do that on the 9th of January. Okay. On the 16th of January, the town of Easton will proclaim the same thing. And so we're really excited that the two have come together to proclaim the year of Frederick Douglass. Oh, that's wonderful. That alone means a lot to sure. our committee and to the people sure. of our county. Um, in February, we'll, the Chesapeake College, in partnership with the Frederick Douglass Honor Society, will have a luncheon that will honor Frederick Douglass and his 200th birthday. And that's on the, on the 3rd of February. Okay. And then, um, just, just to name a couple things that are going on, on the 10th of February will be the kickoff, official kickoff of the celebration for the year here in Easton at the Milestone. There is going to be a prayer breakfast. Oh, good. And, um, and that prayer breakfast will be coming together with family members of Frederick Douglass, the Bailey family. Yeah, um, yeah. Also, um, Reverend Clarence Wayman is going to be the guest speaker. Oh, and wow. he's a friend. He's a, he has a connection with Frederick Douglass in terms of a family, yeah. um, and Give that's going to be a big thing. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm <laughs> really I know excited it's, about I know. this. We have so many organizations: the Academy Art Museum, the, the Talbot County Free Library, and I don't want to leave out anybody. Right, so I'm going to stop right, right now. Right, right. But every organization from Oxford, Trap, St. Michael's, Easton. Um, we have Eastern Shore committees from uh, library in Worcester County. We have UMES, the University yep. of Maryland Eastern Shore, yep. who's participating. Um, Washington College is participating oh, throughout terrific. the year. Chesapeake College, as I said before. Um, Bethel Amy Church, Asbury United Methodist Church. Uh, there are so many organizations and individuals who are participating in this. Talbot Rising. Um, I, I know I said I was going to stop yeah, no, doing that because no, I'm, I'm leaving out, but BAM is participating. There is just so many organizations who have come together. We've been meeting since August yes. to plan this year-long celebration. Oh, One, there, I could name a couple of for each month, but I wanted to say that uh, in September, we not only have Frederick Douglass Day on the 22nd of September, but on the 12th of September, 
the Frederick Douglass Honor Society and the Talbot County NAACP have partnered with Queen Anne's County Arts Council to bring Dr. Michael Eric Dyson to Chesapeake College. I know that. Oh, that's right, because you're a part of that too. <laughs> I forgot you're a part of that too. So you know that um, they're going to be free tickets. It's, for, it's open to the public yes. free. You're just going to need an advanced ticket. Yes. So everybody save some of the dates I'm talking about because you're going to hear more. There's more to come. Every month right, we're going to have, from January through December, we're going to have events. If people want to, is there a website? Is there, yes. uh, let, let's, and then I'll have, I'll mm -hmm. have them put it up underneath the. the Fred, <laughs> I know I'm going to get this wrong. It's okay. But it's the Frederick Douglass 200th Celebration. Dot com. Dot, I think it's dot com. Okay. Um, we, 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 will, we will check yes, it out. Yes, I will, I will make sure yes. you get the correct one. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions, we can call me and I'll get yes. in touch with you. Yes. But uh, yes. no, this is this is so important on, on, on so many levels. Um, uh, I, I don't need to give a sermon, but we, we understand. Okay. And, and, and uh, there are so many exciting things. It is. Yeah. And having the good doctor come in in September, is, that's going to be very exciting. exciting. All of it is very exciting. And when you say that um, it's exciting for so many reasons, one, one of the reasons I, I feel that it's exciting is because it gives us an opportunity, especially the way the world is today, and especially the way our country is today, that we're able to bring so many diverse yes, people together yes, for one cause, and a cause that is so good well so I'm, no uh, i'll just it, it's just th th this is the celebration of an individual mm -hmm. who was able to uh, in spite of history and reality leave a mark that the rest of us from his time forward have felt and have been uh, made better by yes and, yes and that's that's yes that's why celebrating his life and the life of others like Frederick Douglass is so important. It, is. it makes a statement about where we were and where we are, and not, not that not that we don't have far to go. Yes, I mean, we, yeah. there's always progress is yeah. always a yes. uh, uh, a movement forward, but it certainly is an acknowledgement on a lot of levels as to uh, uh, what he helped accomplish and the foundation he helped to uh, establish. Yes, and everything that Frederick Douglass lived and said gave you hope that there was a better life that there was more to come a better tomorrow yes. and so because of him he is still he can still inspire us to reach for that because there's so many things that give um folks a, a, just a, a depressed state but when we talk about frederick Douglass and what he has done we know and we have seen and can witness what can be. Absolutely. What I encourage be. folk to read some of his writings. Yeah. And, and you don't have to read all the volumes, just a little, yes, little bit. Yes. You, you, you immediately become engaged in, in his writing and there is a sense of uplift. I'm yes, I, inspired. I, I recognize I'm speaking for myself, but that's how I, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. from, from the very first time in college, I mean, a long time ago, I said, wow, this is, this is something uh, that needs to be yeah. dealt yeah. with more. Yeah. This is so exciting. Um, so it's a whole year-long celebration. Mm -hmm. We'll have mm -hmm. lots of time to party and celebrate on a lot of good levels. We will get the uh, correct. Uh, oh yes. The correct website. Absolutely. What else should we be talking about? What else do we need to know? I want I want everyone to know that the Talbot County Public School Systems are involved as well. Oh good. And so there are a lot of opportunities for young people to learn more about Frederick Douglass. The um, Bill Peak. The library guy sure. will be going into the middle schools, to Eastern Middle School and St. Michael's Middle School, and doing um, lectures and discussions Wonderful. on Frederick Douglass. Now, the eighth graders right now are already there's already a curriculum. Oh, for excellent! Eighth graders in Talbot County has really done a great job. Oh, with I'm that. so glad to hear and that. And so, getting it deeper in in is is what our goal is as well. And the Frederick Douglass um, family. One of their initiatives is to get the narrative of Frederick Douglass in every school in the United States, every student in the oh, hands goodness. of every student in every school in the United States. And so we're trying to do our part by distributing those books to young people so that they can start reading it and know more about him 
and join in the celebration. That's the most important thing for us is to make sure that young people hear the words of Frederick Douglass. I couldn't agree more. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, we've been talking to my dear friend Harriet Lowry, who is chairwoman, chairperson of the Frederick Douglass 200th birthday celebration, which begins literally in a couple in of a days. Couple with, days. Yeah, <laughs> yes. with, with the onset of 2018. Yeah. Well, um, you will be back. I want to. I want to okay. continue. Uh, from time to time, just checking in and okay. seeing where we are, how it's going. I'm very excited about this. This is this is good for the community. It's good for the state. It's good for the nation. Yes. And it's good yes. for the world. Yes. yes. So uh, thank you for what you're doing. I look forward to uh, many reports about uh, uh, how Frederick Douglass is doing these days. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway. Uh, I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> uh, I'll behave. And you've been seated with Harriet Lowry and with me, Rabbi Peter Hyman, at the Rabbi's Roundtable. I, I pray uh, that uh, 2018 will be a year of joy and of health, of success, of, of all good that, uh, and that we can uh, enjoy and by which we benefit for all of us. Easton, we will see you next time next year on the Rabbi's Roundtable. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs>